Man, I'm super pumped to be up here. Um, for those who don't know, my name's Chef, the middle school pastor, like Pastor just said. And I'm going to be honest. <clears throat> when Pastor Hobby first uh, texted me uh, about today, he, he used the phrase, hey, can you call me when you get a chance? <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm going to be honest. We have a very healthy church staff here. Like, we do a very good job of loving ourselves and loving our staff members. And so um, I shouldn't have been scared. But my boss just texted me he wanted to talk, so I'm getting fired. And <laughs> I feel like I just got here, and, you know, I don't know what Rig, his son, told him about me in middle school ministry. So I'm like, man, it's been a, it's been a good ride. Um, so I call him back, and I'm like, hey, Pastor. And he pops the question, hey, can you speak for me this weekend? And I pause. And I'm, I look at the phone, I'm like, this is a prank, man. They're trying to get me again. I look at Natalie and my wife, I'm like, He's, who's... I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, pastor, 100%. I hang up the phone, and I look at Natalie, and I'm like, Natalie, what did I just agree to do? Or like, what did I just say yes to? And she looks at me as the supportive wife she is, and she says, I have no idea. I don't know why you didn't say let me think about it first. And I'm like, okay, you're not helping. And so I walk away from her, and I'm like, okay, okay. I tell you all this to say, our pastor values this staff so much that he would allow even me, the middle school pastor, to come up here and share, man, what I feel like this church, our church needs to hear as we step into this new season, to step into this new year. And so, man, he values us so much. And so, Pastor Robbie, thank you for trusting the God. Thank you for trusting the Holy Spirit. Thank you for trusting me. And I greatly appreciate this moment right here. As I thought about today and what our church needs to hear, there's a, a theme, a common theme that has been running and, and ringing every day in my life, in my head, in my heart, in my family's heart. And that theme is this. Loving yourself is key. Love for ourselves is key. And that has been our theme as a family. And so I don't know how your family operates. I don't know how your family is. I know that our family has issues. <laughs> I'm just going to be real. Like, we got real problems. Like, like we, got, we got cheaters. Like, we got enablers. We got alcoholics. We got it all. We got the mental illness. We, I mean, we, the list goes on. We got issues. And as we kind of walk in truth and walk in counseling, shout out to Tom Strader, our counselor, <laughs> we have slowly and truly and eventually are getting to the spot where we are able to really love ourselves. And that's why Galatians 5, 14 is my next tattoo. It's going to say, I mean, it's, it's the, the scripture. It says, man, the whole law is fulfilled in this one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law is fulfilled in this one statement. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so I had this shovel. You probably think, okay, why do you have a shovel, chef? Why, why are you walking? Like, because today... Man, we're gonna have to dig in a little bit. Man, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to dig in. We're, we're not going through the, we're not gonna do this surface level thing. Like we're, we're, we're gonna dig in a little bit because loving yourself, as simple as it sounds, is extremely hard to do. As simple as the concept may sound, it's hard for us to kind of really do as humans. Because it's easier to kind of walk through life and stay on this surface of life. For me, um, loving myself was doomed from day one. And, for, and the reason was because I grew up in a certain particular way. And so before I say that, I need everybody to put their right hand up. Right hand up. And what you're going to do is you're going to put the invisible seatbelt on. Just, just put it on. I don't want anybody leaving when I say this. It's going to get real awkward for me to do it. But I got to say it, and it's part of my story, and this is why it was hard for me to love myself. I grew up in a black supremacist cult. Nobody leave. <laughs> All right? A black supremacist cult where the guy who was running the cult believed he was a son of God, basically. Like he was the second coming. And so my parents, at a young age, they start to follow this guy. His name is Yahweh Ben Yahweh is what he called himself. This is the picture of him. It was founded in Florida 
and with thousands, thousands of followers, predominantly all black. And so his message was that the black culture people were the chosen race and that white people were the devil, but we don't talk about it. That part's not important. That's not important. But what is important is that this cult that I grew up in, my parents had to lose sense of self. And like most cults operate, you live and survive for the cult leader or for the cult organization itself. My parents were friends, and slowly but surely, they were seen as just good friends in the cult leader's eyes. And he said, okay, you two are good friends. You're getting married. There was no love. There was no romance. There was no, like, taking my first date. There was none of that. They were married on the stage just like this with 15 other couples. As customary, when you are having a baby, you would bring your child to the cult leader, and he would name us. So my name, Shephatiah, was given to me, not by my parents, not following the baby book, but by a, a man Yahweh ben Yahweh, who was a cult leader. So at a very young age, I was very confused. <laughs> I couldn't eat certain things. I couldn't go outside during certain times of the day. It was weird. And I was lost in a sense of who am I? Well, the FBI comes in, kicks the cult leader into jail, and they, get whatever, they dismantle everything. And years later, I become a Christian. And so my identity was now in Christ, but still there, was, uh, there wasn't a lot talked about, man, loving yourself, even in the Christian world. And so I tried to figure out what does that look like as I communicate that to us today? Because I, what I feel like happens is in the Christian world, we don't talk about loving yourself because we don't want to talk about or confuse it with being selfish. And that's a very common misconception. Sometimes loving yourself can sound like, oh, you just, want, you, just, you just want to be selfish. And I want to clear some things here today. Because loving yourself does not mean neglect others. Loving yourself does not mean you just go buy yourself a bunch of stuff and like, hey, chef said love myself. Run it up, run it up. Like, I, like, that, that, that's not loving yourself in a healthy biblical way. That's not what we're talking about. We're going to see today that the exact opposite happens. That when you truly, deeply love yourself, when you truly dig in and move past the surface level, because, I mean, we all got issues, right? But when you start to really dig in, I'm like, okay, who am I? What is my real issue? How do I move past this? How do I grow? What happens is some things start to be uncovered when you start to really dig in, right? Some family wounds start to un cover when you start to really dig in. Some insecurities start to arise when you start to really dig in. And when you finally see those things, you see yourself. And what you see, you may not like always, but you finally see yourself. And I hope, my prayer is, that just like the verse says, the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. That because of us seeing ourselves and loving ourselves, maybe for the first time, that we can truly love our neighbors. Like truly, deeply love our neighbors and have compassion for others. Today's... Today's passage is going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. It'll be on the screen also. This is where we're going to pick up our story. And I love that God gave me this. As I was trying to figure out what I'm going to preach on, man, God gave me this, and I just kind of confirmed everything that I was feeling. This is what it says in verse 1 of chapter 18 verse, in 1 Samuel. It says this, When David had finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan was bound to David in close friendship and loved him, here's that phrase, as he loved, what does it say? Himself. And he loved him as he loved himself. Saul kept David with him from that day on and did not let him return to his father's house. 
So I got that phrase, loved him, asked himself, because it's crazy because I've never noticed this part of the passage. I've never noticed that it was there. But now I can't unsee the people in the Bible who love themselves, and I can't unsee the people in the Bible who don't love themselves and hate themselves and how they operate, how they interact with people, how they treat people. It's so obvious, like, oh, man, okay, that person really didn't love themselves because they were able to do these things. I'm telling you, if we get this, it changes everything. Students in the room, if we get this, it changes everything. Parents in the room, if we get this, grandparents, abuelo, abuela, tia, tio, if we get these things, nana, papa, whoever, like, like who, everybody, if we get these things, it changes how we interact with our community. It changes how our marriages thrive. It changes everything to understand love for yourself. It's going to take work, though. It takes work. It takes us digging in, like I said. But gone are the days in my family of just this surface-level interaction. We, we go deep and we get real because we know at the end of the day we have to love ourselves before we can love each other. Let's keep reading. Verse 3 says, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as much as he loved himself. There it is again. Then Jonathan removed the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his military tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. This is my first point. This is my first point. It's huge. Compassionate people share. Compassionate people share. You see, to show compassion, to, to show love to people, you have to share. And we see Jonathan doing that exact thing. He starts to give David certain things. He gives him his robe. He gives him a military tunic. He gives him a sword. He gives him his weapon. Now listen, Jonathan was a warrior. He was the son of Saul, but he was a warrior. And so for a warrior to give another man his weapons, to give him his military tunic, it's a big deal. To give him the robe he was wearing, it's a big deal. But it wasn't too big for Jonathan to do because he had a certain love for David. He had a certain compassion for David. So I understand, one of the signs of you truly loving yourself is you sharing and again, I'm not talking about you sharing physical things. Like, I'm not talking about you just giving money. Like, I'm not talking about you just giving stuff. Like, that's, that's kind of easy, honestly. Like, some of us in the room would honestly prefer to give away stuff to somebody that we're close to than to actually open up emotionally. Mm. Oh, I'm digging. I told you I'm digging. I told you I'm digging, right? Like, some of us would rather, hey, let me just give you this so I don't have to actually be vulnerable around you. Hey, instead of me spending time, like, let me just, let me just give you some stuff to suffice what I can't really get to in the place in my heart with you because the pain is buried so deep and I'm not digging it up. Compassionate people share not just stuff, but they share hard things. They share hard truths, right? Like things that are hard to say, like you want to throw up by just saying something that's in your gut. And you're like, I don't even know how to say this, but ah, you hurt me. I said it. Compassion, people who love themselves share hard things. They share things. Emotional, vulnerable things. And they share stuff. <laughs> oh, my gosh. My glasses just broke like that. <laughs> All right. That's how we doing it. All right. <laughs> I'll pick that up real quick. Now I can't see nothing, but it's fine. <laughs> they share. And so we see Jonathan sharing with David. Man, it's, it's huge to think about how much we don't share with those we love. And I think at the root of that is that, man, we struggle with loving ourselves. 
and so we don't share hard things. So here's a hard question. What's stopping you from loving yourself today? What's stopping you from sharing hard things right now? Like I know in a room this size, there are some things tucked away in our hearts that man, like if they only knew, like there's some things that, has, that have maybe possibly happened to you that you have tucked away and said, you know what? I'm just never gonna share that. Like there's no way. Like in your brain, you matter this much. And so there's no way nobody's gonna really care to hear your real story. You have no love for yourself, so there's no way you're gonna trust anybody to ever love the truth about you. What is it for you? What's stopping you from being a compassionate sharer? from sharing the truth to the people who love you. Compassionate people share. Compassionate people share. One of the things I think stops me personally and may stop you also is comparison. Comparison stops me a lot of times from sharing hard, true things. I I, I find myself comparing myself to other people. And we we see that same kind of thing happening in this passage with Saul and David and Jonathan. The next verse says this in verse six, as the troops were coming back, we're still in verse chapter 18, as the troops were coming back, when David was returning from killing the Philistines, the women came out of the city of Israel to meet King Saul, singing and dancing with tambourines, with with shouts of joy and with three string instruments, and they danced. The women saying this, Saul has killed his thousands. Here's the comparison. But David, his tens of thousands. Look at the response of Saul. Saul was furious and resented this song. They credit tens of thousands to David? He complained, but they only credit me with thousands? What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. What welled up inside of Saul that day was this comparison between him and David. And what happened next? happens to each and every one of us when we don't truly love ourselves and we start to compare ourselves to other people, what's birthed next happens to each and every one of us. Look at what it says. It says this, the next day an evil spirit from God came powerfully on Saul and he began to rave inside the palace. David was playing the liar as usual. But Saul was holding a spear, and he threw it, thinking, I'll pin David to the wall. But David got away from him twice. Saul literally tried to kill David after the comparison was made. Here's our second point. Comparison kills compassion. Comparison kills compassion. So I grew up in Miami, and for those who know Miami's crazy, it's just, it's just wild. It's a wild place. Um, and as a kid, uh, man, as, I, as sheltered as I was, you know, being in the cult and everything, when we got out the cult, um, I was still kind of sheltered, but I still found my way into trouble. Um, and so as I remember my high school years, we did some dumb stuff. Anybody ever did some dumb stuff? Like, just like, hey, you're just dumb for doing that. Like, like, I know some parents have seen your kids do dumb things. And so, yes, you've seen it and you've probably done some dumb things. This is a dumb story. Just want to preface that. Kids, don't do this, please. All right, got that out of the way. At night, we would go to the highway. And, man, there was a spot where there were some rocks 
And, um, man, we would sit on the side of the highway and look at the cars driving by. And I wish we would just have just stopped there, um, but we didn't. And we thought, you know what? I bet you can't hit that car that's driving 80 miles an hour on the highway. And um, one bet turned to everybody doing it. And so we decided just to pick up rocks and to start to throw them as hard as we could at these cars driving by um, on the highway. Very dumb. Um, as I start to think back, I'm like, man, I could have killed somebody. I, I literally could have been a part of a car crashing and somebody dying. Well, that night, I'll never forget, we were doing dumb things, throwing rocks at cars, and as we're sitting um, on like a power electric box throwing these rocks, um, I look behind me, and unbeknownst to everybody that was with us, there was a cop sneaking up behind us. Are there any cops in the room? Is that, is that protocol? Do you sneak up behind people like that? Is that something that y'all in training? Oh, we'll talk later. We'll talk later, Bubbles. Sneaking up behind us. And thank God, oh my gosh, I saw him. And I was like, cop! And this is the only and one time, only one time I ran from the cops, okay? I ran from the cops. Don't judge me. Um, I jump off, and there's six of us, and we're all running. And we're just, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm actually running from the cops. This is insane. How did I get here? Man, we were just sitting, and now I'm running from the cops. And I turn, and there's a cop literally chasing me. And I'm like, I'm running from, like, this is a surreal moment. Like, wow, this is like a movie, but it's not, and I'm scared. So <laughs> running from the cops, and we have a friend. His name is Cheeseburger Mike. <laughs> Follow me. He got this name because he liked cheeseburgers and he was overweight. So I didn't know Cheeseburger Mike had asthma. I thought he was just slow. So, so we're running from the cops and Cheeseburger Mike is about to get caught. And like, we're like, I'm running and an evil thought <laughs> pops into my head. I'm like, do I trip him? Like, he's not really close to me, but like, do I stop and trip him? Because here's the backstory. Me and Cheeseburger Mike have been in competition our entire friendship. In our friendship, man, we were kind of the low, overweight kids in the group, and so we're always kind of wrestling and trying to outdo each other, and like, you know, like, comparison is what our friendship was kind of built on. And so in that moment, I look back at Cheeseburger Mike, and he's... <gasps> And our friends are literally trying to grab him and, and drag his feet. I think, I, I think at this point, his feet are just like doing this. So they're just dragging. He's not even running anymore. And I look back and I'm like, man, I hope he gets caught. And as I think about that thought now, I'm like, man, how messed up. Somebody I could hang out with every day. We hung out all the time, every weekend, went to parties together. Like this, and, I, and in that moment, I was like, man, I hope he gets caught. All compact. All compassion in that moment was gone because comparison had creeped in and killed whatever compassion that I was supposed to have in my friend instead of helping him run from the cops, which I get is bad. I get it. I was hoping he got caught. Comparison in your own life kills any compassion you could ever have for somebody. And, 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 let me, can, I, can, I, can I be real for a second? Can I be real? All right, let me hear you say it. Say, chef. Come on, I do this in middle school all the time. Say, chef. Yeah. Be, real. be real. Be real. All right. You asked for it. <laughs> yeah, the hair got to come down from being real. Um, <laughs> as a parent, one of the hardest things to teach my kids, I have three kids, one of the hardest things to teach my kids is, one, to be kind. It's like I'm constantly trying to teach them to not be mean. It's crazy. Um, and the second thing is, I'm always going to be smarter than you. <laughs> like, they have to understand that. But above those two things... Loving themselves is right there. How do I teach my, my kids to love themselves? How do I teach 
this next generation as the middle school pastor to love themselves. And this is home for me personally and, and, and I, I, on a family level. It, it hits in a few different levels because understand what I say. When I say Sumner County is one of the most special places on earth. Like we live in a very unique, strong community and it's super, super rare to find places like this. And people like Jeff Borton, people like Angie and Mike Hurst, man, they have made this place home for us. This is our home. But hear me when I say, this is my home, but I'm not from here. <laughs> like, like, this is my home, and we don't want to leave, and we have no plans to leave. But I'm not from here. And the fact that I'm not from here is reminded to me every time I'm on my way to work and I see a Confederate flag on the same road I drive to here every day. I'm reminded I'm not from here. The fact that I'm not from here is reminded to me every time my son comes home and he's telling me about how he was made fun of because he has dreads also. And the culture that we are in right now doesn't understand our hair. I'm reminded I'm not from here. And these questions that he is getting about his hair is building these layers of comparison in his life, which make it hard for, what makes it hard for him to love a part of himself. And now a part of himself is in question. And now he doesn't know who he is at some layer of his life. All I have to say is this. As a parent, one of the things I've learned, and as a, a student minister who's been doing ministry with students, high school, middle school for over a decade, counseling parents and families, this overarching theme has been my kid doesn't love themselves. Middle school boys and girls are saying, I don't really love myself. Parents are trying to figure out how do I encourage my son and my daughter to look at themselves and love themselves. If you need some proof of that, just go look at the teen suicide numbers. Our kids, our generation is struggling with comparison because they don't love themselves. They don't. And so parents... Here's what I want to say to you today as I wrap up today. Take the phones at night. <laughs> Take it. Take the phones at night. Give boundaries. Track screen time. Do your best with social media. Comparison is the thief of joy. Social media is the father Comparison is the mother, and together they birth death. Not figuratively death, like, like actual death is birth from these things. Lives are lost because of these things. Students, this is what I need to say to you. Take periodical breaks from social media. I can't, I'm not going to say, hey, stop it because I, I, I've done there. Yeah, you're not stopping. Cool, we get it. Take breaks. <laughs> Take some periodical breaks. Take a break from the comparison you're being fed to constantly online. Take a break from it. And as you take a break, watch as your life returns to you. Watch as you start to appreciate even the small things around you. Watch as for the first time you start to actually appreciate and love what God has created. As you start to love yourself. And I promise you, when you strip these things away or you balance these things out, you're going to look at yourself in the mirror. You're going to say, man, you know what? Ooh, 
boy cute. Wait, hold on. For the first time, you may actually see yourself. Like really see you. Let's do this. If you have a phone right now, go ahead, open your camera. Open your camera. And for the, for the, um, the older crowd, it's my next you make just help you find that in your phone. <laughs> and just... And, and what you're going to do is you're going to turn the camera facing yourself. And we're going to take a, a selfie together. I want you to take a selfie. Everybody grab your phone, take a selfie right now. However you want to do it. You can smile, you can not smile. Get your family in it, I don't care. Take a selfie right now. It's the only time you're going to be told to take a selfie in church. I promise you that. And after you have taken this selfie, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go home, and after you got your church clothes off, makeup's off, everything's off, not everything, uh, just... <laughs> I had to preface that real quick. Just everything off your face is off. I want you to take another picture. And I don't want you to smile. I want you to do whatever you feel in that moment. Because here you're going to smile because we're at church. You know? Everybody smiles at church. You don't come to church sad. Like, stay home for that. Nobody wants to see that. Right? That's crazy, right? We're supposed to be able to come here and be sad, <laughs> honestly. We're supposed to be able to come here and be real. No mask around people that you can trust. Like, this is what church is for. But I, I think we've, we've drifted into church anti instead of Christianity. So I want you to take that picture here, and I want you to take a picture when you get home of how you really feel. And if it's, man, man, I've been sad for years, and this is how I really feel. I had to smile at church because I was in front of people taking a selfie. But I'm home, and this is how I really feel. And what I want you to do is, I want you to compare the two. And I want, I want you to compare how often you walk around with that first picture on your face. Having to put up this front, this mask, and you really don't feel that way. And I want you to know that every time you walk around with that first picture on your face, you aren't really loving yourself. You aren't being honest. You aren't walking in truth. And I'm telling you, God wants you to be in that second spot and work from there. If you walk around with this mask on all the time, I'm telling you, you're going to miss out on the work because it will be work. You're going to have to dig. But when you finally say, okay, this is where I really am. This is where I am in life right now. And I'm being honest for the first time. I don't feel like smiling. And then once you get to that point, you can actually see yourself. And when you actually see yourself, then possibly you can finally know yourself. And when you can finally know yourself, you can work from the level and get to where you can possibly love yourself. And you love yourself. You see yourself and know yourself the way Jesus sees, knows, and loves you. And I know it's, it's hard to just get to that place with no foundation. My foundation is Jesus. My foundation of how I see myself, it starts with Jesus. My foundation of how I know myself, it starts with Jesus. My foundation of how I love myself, it starts with Jesus. Here's the question. Do you see, know, and love yourself the way Jesus sees, knows, and loves you? Do you? Are you ready to do the work? It will take work. Are you ready to do the work? So I'm saying Jesus is waiting. He's, he's here. He's waiting. Who's willing to do the work? Who's ready to do the work? 
I'm telling you, if you continue not loving yourself and trying to love others, you're going to hurt people. You're going to hurt people. This next song we're going we're gonna to sing, I'm going to ask you to respond. I'm going to ask you to respond. And, and in this moment, if you're saying, Chef, man, I, I'm dying to have the faith that whatever you just said up there, I want that. <laughs> like, I've never loved myself. I never have experienced love. I, I, I give stuff away, but I, I don't do it because I love myself. I do it because I, I think I have to, and this is how I can show love. I, like, I don't, I, don't, I don't love people the way they need to be loved. I love people the way I think I know what love to be, and I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. But I, I want to start I want to start growing. I want to start doing the work. I want to start loving myself so I can love those around me. I want Galatians 5.14. I want to love others the way I love myself. I'm here to tell you that starts with knowing Jesus. So if that's you in this next song, man, make your way over here in the Next Steps area. Talk to, talk to one of the counselors back there. And you get home take that picture again and have a real just kind of moment with your family and ask some hard questions. Hey, have I loved you well? Man, is there anything you haven't told me? Is there anything that you have buried that you are, are struggling with that is causing you not to love yourself? Is there any, like, these are the hard questions that me and my family ask often because we're messed up. <laughs> Thank y'all for allowing me to speak truth today. Let me pray. God, we love you. God, thank you for the truth that you love us. The truth that you love me, Jesus. Despite everything, you see me, you know me, and you love me still. Jesus, I hope everybody in this room will get to a real place, a place of truth, of honesty where they can say, okay, the masks are coming off. I will walk in truth and I will get to a place of loving myself the same way Jesus loves me. I pray all these things in your name, Jesus Christ.